Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the welcome. It's great to be here. Um, this is the, uh, I think, the second time I've been in this auditorium, so it's been a long time. Um, we did talk about the last time I preached, it was in the other church up the top and uh, many years ago when I was the DS, so a um, long time ago. Uh, it's great to be here today and uh, great to share with you and thank you for the opportunity. And yes, I am stuck in uh, Queensland. Um, it's not a bad place to be stuck, uh, as you would all attest, I'm sure. Um, the, the thing about being stuck here isn't that I'm actually stuck. I can go back. I just would go to my house and sit there for a few weeks and I prefer to be free to roam around. And, and sadly, we have to think about this as a, a difficult thing for uh, New South Wales, which is in a lockdown, or the whole New South Wales in a lockdown this week. So um, that's on my heart too. Um, as uh, you know, my wife is here with me. Uh, we have four children. They're spread uh, in different places, uh, Toowoomba and uh, Brisbane and uh, Melbourne. So when we're in Sydney, we're somewhere in the middle. <laughs> uh, but it's nice to be here and we've been able to get to see our, our new grandchild and uh, that's been fun for us. And uh, so it's great to be here. Today, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about uh, something that I began. I was thinking about this. I began the process in 2019. I looked at the scriptures and I, I began, as I was reading the Bible, and, and I don't know if this happens to you, every now and then you, you wonder some things. So I was reading the Bible and I was reading the words of Jesus, and Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees and to the Sadducees and to the temple rulers. And, and if you read your Bible every now and then, you'll see that as Jesus speaks to these people, he has a few words to say. And sometimes they're pretty clever. You know, he'll say, you brood of vipers, you snakes, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? And I'm like, there you go, Jesus. <laughs> you tell him. You tell him. And he says, you guys, you're like whitewashed tombs on the outside. You're all nice and shiny, but on the inside, you're like dead men's bones. And I go, you go, Jesus. You tell him. You know, those Pharisees. You know, and, and so as I began to read that, I was going, well, wait, 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 wait. What if? See, because who was Jesus talking to that time? Well, he was talking to religious leaders, right? And then I began to reflect on this as you heard the introduction, you know, Lex did this and Lex did that and went here and went there. And, and, and I thought to myself, well, well, I'm, I'm a religious leader. I mean, I don't like to think of myself as a Pharisee, but, but I'm a religious leader. What if those words of Jesus spoken to those religious leaders, which I skipped over because I thought that was for them, what if God was speaking to me? What if he had some words to say in those words that not just me, it's, I'm just going to pretend, thank you, I'm going to pretend that it might actually be, it might actually, it might actually be you and me, you know, who, who ask this question every now and then, what if, uh, you know, we are the ones that Jesus is speaking to? And what if we've just skipped, and I thought, maybe we've skipped whole passages of Scripture and ignored any message that's in there because it wasn't written to me. Hmm. So that began a process 2019, and I started to look, well, I'm going to look at the life of Jesus, particularly the teachings of Jesus where he talked to the religious leaders, and I'm going to summarize those, and I'm going to ask myself, what would Jesus say to religious leaders if he was speaking to me? That began, I said, in, in January 2019. Um, I'm in Matthew 13. It's taken me this long to get that far, that's because every time we read the scriptures together, my wife and I, we meet with another couple, we read the scriptures together, we ask this question, I'm blown away by the depth of what God speaks to me about. And as I began to reflect on this, I thought, well, hang on, it's not just what Jesus said to the spiritual leaders, maybe there's a whole bunch of things that Jesus did. That if I asked the question, what would Jesus say to me if he was doing these things as an example to me as a religious leader? What would he be saying to me by doing these things? I can't tell you how amazing our Bible study has been as I begin to unpack what this teaching might be. But it's not the teaching that's obvious. It's the teaching that comes out from that. And I began to collate these things. I, I, I began to think this is something that perhaps we all need to hear. Now, I say, what would Jesus say to religious leaders? And, and I'm a religious leader, so, but before you shut off and you think to yourself, of course, you should, you should probably speak to Rob because he probably needs to hear this. And, and there's Merrill and, and there's some other religious leaders around that they ought to hear this message. I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever had any ideas about how the church should be run? 
I'm just asking, maybe you've sat there in church and gone, oh my goodness, they're singing that song again. I would never sing that song in church. That's wrong to sing in church. Oh, I, well, the church shouldn't run this way. It should run that way. If the church was doing it properly, it'd look like this. Right? And, and if you, and I want to tell you a thing or two about how you ought to run the church. If you've ever, ever been guilty of that, the sound's too loud, the song's too fast, the chairs are too soft. Back when the day we used to have pews and that kept us awake. You know, I don't know. If you've ever said anything about the church, maybe, just maybe, you're a wannabe religious leader too. Maybe you would like to run the church. I, I, I'm saying just as a pastor because I have the job of leading in the church. I can't tell you the amount of times people have told me how to lead the church. You know, and, and I'm, I got trained to how to lead the church, and, and I'm still not that good at it, but there's plenty of people that know how to do it, right? So I'm just saying, maybe, probably not here in Maribyrnong, I don't know, or Harvey Bay, I don't, I don't know, but maybe there's some people who you've ever, ever thought to yourself, I think I know how to do this. Maybe there's some messages in this for you. And you're in a series on discipleship, so, so what about this? You know, maybe there's some messages for us as disciples, Maybe there's some things in Jesus' teaching for the religious leaders. We've skipped over because we thought it was for them, but it's actually for us. We could learn a thing or two. We could understand a thing or two. And so I, I began this process. And as I said, it's taken us a long time, but I'm absolutely loving it. Uh, look, if I ever uh, take on the senior pastor of, of a church again, um, this will be a 52-week series, right? So... You probably And you probably won't want to come to church because after the first one, you'll go home depressed, right? So not really, but there's such powerful teaching there. It's very challenging. Anyway, so I thought, well, this is actually the first in a series of messages and, and I probably would never get to the end of those messages, but this one's called Start Here. And the title really was, if you want to, what would Jesus say to spiritual leaders? He'd say, start here, right? So in a sense, what would Jesus say to disciples? Anyone who wants to go and, and say something about how the church should run, anyone who thinks that they know something about what Christians ought to be, anybody who wants to start that journey of faith, right? You know, you're talk, talking about disciples. Anyone who wants to be a disciple of Jesus, Jesus would say, start here. And so I, I just started in Matthew. I read Matthew. And, and we're begin, going to begin by talking about, I'm not going to read the whole passage right now, but we're going to talk about Jesus' baptism and then the temptation of Jesus. And we're going to ask the question, what, what would Jesus say to us through these examples? And he would say, I think, start here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you four principles of leadership, if you like, four principles of discipleship, perhaps even better, four unmistakable things that you must look at if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, four things that will change your life, four things that if you get them wrong will actually mean that your leadership or your religious expressions and the things that you do will fall apart at some point because they won't be based on the right kind of foundation. These four things I'm going to talk to you about today. And I want to talk to you about them because I don't know if you've ever imagined this. We read this story about Jesus. He got baptized and then he, he, he was tempted by the devil. He, he was led by the Holy Spirit. Ever thought about this? He was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert to be tempted. And if you're like me, you thought, well, of course Jesus had to be tempted. He was the Son of God, wasn't he? And he had to prove that he wasn't going to sin. But when you ask this question, what would Jesus say to religious leaders? I ask this question, well, why wouldn't this be for all of us? Why did Jesus only have to be tested in these things? Maybe all of us have to be tested in these things. Maybe, these, maybe the seeds of these temptations are actually the things we all must face. And without getting them right, or without deciding where we're at with it, it, it falls down. So let me share them with you. The first one of these tests I think that we should face, if we want to be a disciple of Jesus, if we want to be a, a backseat a religious leader, or if I want to take on the church, would be this. It's the identity test. It's the identity test. What's your identity? Where does it come from? And I get this from that passage uh, in uh, Matthew, and it's in chapter 3. It's about the uh, baptism of Jesus, and it says this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be now. It is proper for us to do this, 
to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water. And at that moment, heaven opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. What would Jesus say to spiritual leaders? What would Jesus say to disciples? He'd say, start here. Start here. Start here. This is the place you start. Jesus himself submitted himself to who? The Father. And he said, I won't do my will, but your will. We, we're most familiar with that because we go across to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, we know what it says Jesus says there. He's, he's in a sense tempted and he's tested. And he says, if this cup can pass from me, please, can we do something else, God? And nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. So from day one to day end, Jesus had this philosophy of ministry, and that was this. I'm not doing my own thing. I'm doing what the Father did. He kept saying this. I'm not telling you what I would say. I'm telling you what the Father would say. I'm not doing what I would do. I'm doing what the Father wants to do. If you want to know what the Father looks like, look at me. I'll point you to the Father. And I'm just saying to all of us, religious leaders, and right down to the wannabe religious leaders, or to anyone who just wants to be a disciple of Jesus, you got to start here. It's not your will. It can never be your will. You can't sit back and say, I would do it this way. Nobody cares. No, listen to me. The kingdom doesn't care what your will is. It's hard to stomach, right? Because when we come to Christ, we relinquish our will. And we submit it to Christ. What's the prayer that we're supposed to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Not my will be done. Thy will be done on earth as in heaven. You know that pattern, God, you have up in heaven where people submit to you and what you want to do, where they bow down before you, where they worship you. You know that pattern up there where people have given themselves and you are the Lord and you are the King. That pattern, we ask, God, bring it here. And your will be done. And it's hard because as leaders, you know, sometimes we want our will. I'm guilty. I want what I want. And the truth is, sometimes you're also guilty of that. You want what you want. And sometimes we say, that's what God wants. Because that's the real trick, isn't it? Because we say, well, I like it, so God must like it. And the reality is, do we ever ask him? Jesus would say, what is your will? What can you do? So test number one, it's a hard one, right? Start here, start with this. It's not your will, it's God's will. It's the identity test. And here's the thing, I call it the identity test because the clincher is this. If you follow God's will, you never have to worry what anyone thinks about you in ministry. You never have to worry whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. You never have to worry if someone criticizes you or not because you're not doing your thing, you're doing God's thing. And, and, and God is already pleased with that. And I know this because the clincher is in that verse, and that verse is at the end of Matthew, uh, at, at verse 17, at the end of the passage, where it says, This is my son, whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. But here's the question for you. Now, some of you are, are going to be tricky with me theologically, theologically, but let's just think about this. What had Jesus done? What had he done? He didn't have a big church. He hadn't written a book. He didn't have any disciples. And Jesus and God said to him from the heaven, he said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. What was God pleased with? He, he, can't, he can't have been pleased that he had finished the work that he'd given him. He, he, Jesus didn't even had, hadn't even died on the cross yet. He hadn't even taught the gospel. He hadn't brought the, the voice of the kingdom. And, and yet God was pleased with him. So what was God pleased about? Well, I submit to you, he was pleased about his submission to the will of God. He was pleased about that Jesus was connected to him. He would be pleased with you in the same uh, vein. And it would be like this. It would be, I'm pleased with you because you're a child of God. Because you belong to me. I'm pleased with you 
because we have a relationship. I'm pleased with you because our relationship is connected. It's not about what you do. That's the identity test. Where is your identity? If your identity comes from the big church you built, then you're in the wrong place. But if your identity comes that you're connected with God and you're doing his will, that's the test that every leader must face. That's the test that every disciple must face. And that's the test. I don't think you just face it once. I think you have to go back to it again and again and again. And you have to ask yourself this question. Am I submitted to the Father's will? Is this what he wants me to do? What does he want to do? Have you ever asked God that? What do you want to do? It's a, it's a, it's a good question to ask. <laughs> and I kind of have this feeling that we believe in prayer, as, as Caleb was saying, you know. And I think God answers our prayers. If you ask him and you listen. Anyway, test one. It's a tough one, isn't it? And I feel like you could almost stop there because that might take a lifetime to master. But Jesus set some more examples. And, and the devil, I mean, sorry, the Holy Spirit, believe it or not, led him in the desert to be tempted. So there's three more tests that I think we need to face. And as I said, we look at Jesus and go, of course he had to be tempted because, you know, he had to prove he was a son of God. But, but I wonder if he had to be tempted to see whether he understood those basic principles of discipleship and, and if we were to do the same thing. So the second test I'd like to, to present to you would be this. It's not the identity test. It's actually the sustenance test. And by this, just putting it out there, what the sustenance test is about is this idea that um, how do I get fed? How do I get fed? What feeds my soul? What keeps me going? Now, this is a hard one because here we have Jesus, and uh, the devil comes along to him and says, I want you to turn these stones into bread. So we can read that, Matthew 4, uh, verses 1 to 4. Uh, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to, to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I, I just want to pause here because I think about this. You know, if you're a good leader, feed yourself. If you're a good Christian, figure out how to feed yourself. Do some, eat some of some of this stuff. You know, turn that into something that sustains you. You know, hey, I'll tell you this. Maybe uh, build a big building. That might sustain you. Oh, do a CD. Make a worship CD. That might sustain you. Write a book. That could make you feel good. Turn that stone into bread. Now, let me continue. <laughs> what did Jesus say? He said, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, this is a, I guess it's another hard one. It's like, this would be like, can we wait another year before we do this one? Because this is also a big deal. Where do you get your sustenance from? What makes you work? How does it work for you? What makes you feel fed? You know, for some of us, we, we're actually interested in listening to the latest prophet, right? That'll tell me what's going on. That'll be good. Or the latest, latest gossip, prophet and gossip, similar kind of things, right? You know, I get this idea. Someone's got something to say. I'm going to listen to them. Oh, I'm going to listen to the latest conspiracy theory that tells me something else is going to happen. I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to listen to that. And we forgot, man does not live by all these things alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's where your sustenance comes from. That's what you eat. That's why Jesus could stand up with the disciples when they went into town to get some hamburgers and he was sitting at the lake. And, you know, by the time they got back, they were all cold. And he could say these words, I'm not hungry. And I'm not hungry because... I have food you know nothing of. My sustenance doesn't come from what I eat. My sustenance doesn't come from how we perform. My sustenance comes from doing the will of the Father, from listening to his words. So again, it's tied in here. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How hungry are you for what God says? You know, we're so hungry. I feel like, you know, years ago... Um, you know, sometimes I, I wouldn't eat breakfast and I wouldn't eat lunch. And on the way home, I'm hungry, so I stop for something and I eat some junk food. And then I get home and my wife would serve up a dinner and I wouldn't be hungry because I ate junk. I feel like sometimes we come like that to God. We go, well, I'm going to eat a whole bunch of junk, God, but I don't really need what you say because I'm kind of full. Well, what are you full of? And this is the question. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of, God, mouth of God. Now, here's the problem what happens to us is if our sustenance comes from what God does for us, 
or what we see happen around us, right? Like the stones turn to bread. Hooray, miracle, stones to bread. I'm getting my sustenance from the miracle. I'm getting my sustenance from the thing that happened. I'm getting my sustenance from something that, that's exciting. And then what happens if it doesn't happen? What happens if God doesn't answer that prayer? What happens if that dream you have doesn't come to fruition? What happens if you don't get there? Well, see, if your sustenance comes from the things that happen that around you, the, the things that you can produce by your miraculous hand, your intervention, right? If your sustenance comes from that, then your life is going to be empty if it doesn't happen. And how many of you have ever been through those moments where you've gone, I just don't sense God near me. I prayed and he doesn't answer my prayer. I don't even know why I'm a Christian anymore. You know, the church isn't the way I want it to be. The pastor preach a dumb message. I don't like those songs. You know, whatever it might be. And, and you're dry. But what would Jesus say to you? Don't be tempted to turn something into bread. Feed off my words. Feed off my words. That's what makes the difference, right? You see, because because this is the example, I think, that this is this idea. I don't feed off what happens to me, I feed off what God says. So my example for this, and, and one I love, is Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego. I feel like these, this is like one of the key, key scriptures. What did they say? They, You know, you bow down to this uh, idol, and they said, no, we're not going to do that. Right, you'd bow down and we'll kill you. We'll throw you in the fire. Hit it seven times harder. You guys are done for. And they said, no, no, we're not going to bow down. Because here's what's going to happen. God's going to rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we're still not bound down to the idol. Think about this. This is profound. You know what we do? We say, God's going to rescue us. And he doesn't. And we go, see, God's nobody. Stupid God. Didn't answer my prayers. Didn't do what I wanted him to do. I told him what to do. He wasn't listening. What they said was, God's going to rescue us because they got trust. They believe in God. But in the end, you know, our, our belief in God is not based on what happens. It's based on who God is. Tell you what, this is a fundamental change to your thinking. If yours is based on the sustenance, your sustenance comes from the things that happen, right? And if they happen the way you like them, then you're sustained. But if they don't happen the way you don't like them or they don't happen, you're not sustained. That's the wrong way to take this, this thing down. So if you're a disciple of Jesus starting out or if you're a leader and you're already seasoned in that or if you want to be leader and you're sitting in the chair, listen to this carefully. It's not about what happens. It's about who God is. That'll change your life. Right? I trust God no matter what. That'll change your life. That'll change the world. All right. So we've got the identity test. We've got the, the, uh, the sustenance test. Thanks. Thanks. And then I, we've got the, uh, the next one is the trust test. And, and this is an interesting one too, right? Because it kind of ties into what we've already talked about. It comes from Matthew 4. 5 to 7, it says this, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, It's also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. I call it the trust test. And here's the problem we have. God says to us, you've heard it. I guarantee there'll be people sitting here today. I had a conversation with Rob yesterday about this, and he mentioned something that God had prompted him to do many years ago. It came back to his mind, right? We all get prompted by God every now and then. Something you should do, a person you should ring, a person you should say sorry to, a challenge, or... God says, I think you could do that. You could lead Sunday school. You could plant a church. Whatever. And we go, well, I don't know. Is that really you, God? I don't know that I trust that. I'm not sure I trust. So we do what Gideon did. Gideon, be a good Christian. God said, mighty warrior, go and defeat the Midianites. Or, you know, mighty warrior, I believe in you. Got a job for you to do. Go and do it. And, and Gideon was a good Christian. He said, don't know that I trust you, God. Don't think you're telling me the truth. Don't think I'm really the good guy. Don't think I can do that. 
I'm just a nobody asking me to do stuff like that. I'm pretty sure you've got rocks in your head and you don't really know. But what I'll do is I'll put out a little test. And we'll all go, good on you, Gideon. Great job, test. That's it. And if God does that test, we'll know we can trust him, right? So we put out the fleece and we say, let the ground be wet and let the fleece be dry. And it was. Gideon, what a great test. Oh, and then he goes, I don't know, God. That's, that's like, that could have just happened. I don't know if I can trust you with that one. I know you said I'm a mighty warrior, but I don't believe you. I know you said the, this that way, but I'm not going to believe you. I'll do one more test because that's the way I'll know it's really you. I'll put it out and let the, I forget which way I said it last time, but let the opposite be true, right? I don't even know which way it's in the scripture because I get them confused. But one's going to be dry, the other's going to be wet. One's going to be wet different way around, right? So, and guess what? It happened. And we're like, good Christianity there, Gideon. We ought to do this. This is a good example in the Bible to follow. If God asks you to do something, test him a couple of times just to see if it's okay. Now, here's what I want to say to you as, as wannabe leaders or you know, disciples or already leaders, um, wrong, 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 wrong. If God says do it, just do it, right? This is trust, right? Either he says it or he didn't say it. Just do it. Don't go, I don't know whether that's you, God. Maybe I'll test you. Um, it's hard. By the way, this is not easy. It's easier. Well, in fact, it's easy to put out the fleece. Maybe I'll test it this way. Maybe I'll test it that way. Maybe I'll ask this. Maybe I'll check that. But here's the thing. Do you trust God or not? That's the thing that Jesus had to settle right there and there. Do you trust God or not? Do I trust what God's saying or not? Do I trust the Father or not? Has to settle that. And here's for all of us. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, here's a few things to settle, right? You have to first settle the identity test. You know, who are you? And who's the Father and what's the will? You next have to settle the sustenance test. That is, where are you going to get your stuff on? You don't get it from what happens. You get it from the words of God. And third, you have to, to, to accept this trust test, which is, are you just going to trust him? That's, that's the issue. And, and for most of us, I'd say even my wife and I often say, you know, we're afraid, God, will you, will you do, what will you do for us? We went to Sydney. We went uh, t- to a very expensive city on 1.6 days a week salary. You know, and, and we don't know. I mean, we've seen God show up before. We're still doubting whether he will because we're not sure we trust him. But we know he called us. So we've learned a little bit over time. We will go. We say yes. Now, this is not crazy stuff, by the way. This is tuned in to God, trying to listen to God. It's not like I woke up and I decided God said I don't have lunch today. I don't know if it's that simple. I think it's more like this this call that God has. Do, Do you trust him? That's the question we all have to kind of resolve. You know, do we trust? And I think when you trust, it changes everything. It does change everything. It doesn't always work out. It doesn't feel good always. Sometimes it's scary. But as a disciple of Jesus or as a leader, trust is important. The next thing I want to add is this. It's the worship test. And, and, and this comes from um, Matthew 4, 8 to 11. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left and the angels came to attend him. This is the question for you and me. Who do we worship? Or who do we let worship us? I think the real key is sometimes we substitute ourselves into the place of Jesus now, that's not just for those of us who lead in the church, but that could be for you sitting in the pew. You, you expect people to, to listen to you because you've got something to say. You know, we, we we're important. But actually, never. I'm not important. Jesus is important. I mean, sure, sorry, hear me out. We're all important. Jesus loves us. Praise God. You know, we're his children. He invited us in. He adopted us in. We got the family. I'm, I'm not saying that. The point is, it's not up to us to be worshipped. It's up to him to be worshipped. It's up to us to send our worship to him. You know, it's so easy to take that place to have all the things. 
Look what I've done. Look what I've got. Look at the people I've got around me. Look at how good I am. You know, uh, God knew this when he said it to the Israelites. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you abundantly, more than you can imagine. And in Deuteronomy 8 and, and a few other places in the Bible, he said, but here's what happens. When you get blessed and things turn out well and everything's going the way I said it would be, don't ever say that your own hands did this. Because I did this through you. And it's so easy for us as a pastor. I can tell you this is true. If something successful happens in your life, what you tend to do is go, look what I did. That's the first step towards downfall. It should never be, look what I did. It should always be, look what he did. He must be greater. I must be less. He must be greater. I must be less. This is the worship test. It's easy to get sidetracked. So let me conclude. There's four tests. I'll be honest with you. When I started this idea, that was the first thing I read. And I was like, I don't think I can keep going. Because what, my question was this. What would Jesus say to spiritual leaders from what he did and from what he said? And when I got to here, I was like, oh, my goodness. And, and, and maybe you're in the same place. Where's your identity? So maybe you're struggling with your identity, and that is like you're thinking, um, you've, you've forgotten that your identity comes from who God is and by submitting to his will. Maybe you're thinking my will is important, and the only way I can get my identity is I have to stamp my ideas on these things and tell people how to do it, whichever level we're at with leadership or wherever we're as a disciple. But what if our job was to submit to God? So my challenge to you, maybe you're in that boat. Maybe for you, this is the test that you're going to face. You're going to face them, I think, today, tomorrow, the next day, 10 years. These are things that I think God says, start here, go back here, revisit here. The question for you is, where's your identity and is it in Christ? Like, is it what he says? You need to be in the garden every now and then. Maybe today's that day. Go to the garden and go, God, I want to see this happen. I feel this. Nevertheless... Not my will, but yours be done. And then maybe there's some of you here today. For you, it's not the identity test that's really the struggle because you do, you, do uh, you know, um, put your trust in God and, and, and in his will. Maybe for you, it's the sustenance test. You, you, you really want to see stuff happen and, and, and when it doesn't, you just, can't, you just can't make it with your Christian life. Maybe some of you at that point, you're going, God never showed up and I'm done with him today. And I didn't even know if I want to be a Christian, right? But what if, what if you chose to get your food from some other kind of source? Not what happened, but what, who God is. That you listen to his words. His words of kindness, his words of love, his words of commitment to you. For some of you, maybe you need, need to be there. For others of you, uh, maybe, the, maybe the issue is not the sustenance test, it's the trust test. Maybe you know, some of you are here today, maybe 20 years ago, God said, I want you to go into ministry. And you said, I don't know that I can trust you on that one, God. I think you're pretty crazy. Nah. And maybe your fleece, it turned out it wasn't dry and wet and it didn't turn out the way you wanted to say, well, that's it. But you know you heard God. You're sitting here today and you know, and some of you can remember it. I'll give you an example of this, one of these people. Um, I mentored and, and I had a guy working for me in um, Hills Church. And I employed him from the workforce in uh, computer sales. He's a very good administrator, <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> so I want you to come for work for me. Work for me. He said, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I'm good enough. He said, I think you'll be fine. I don't know. He actually said no three times. I accepted no. And then he came to me later and he said, oh, I've been thinking about what you said, and I'll do it. I remember years ago, he said, I remember years ago, I sat in a meeting and the minister said to me, oh, actually it was youth camp, went to youth camp and the guy said, who here wants to commit themselves to serve me? And I said yes. But I just forgot about it and I just let it go. And I just got on with my life. But God challenged me that that's the way it should be. So I'm saying yes. So he worked with me for seven years as my um, administrative assistant. And when I left that church to go to Sydney, my wife and I prayed about this. We said, who, who could take over from us? We think it's this guy. 
So I inv- I'd invested my life. I continued to invest my life. And his name is Pastor Nathan Bell. Nathan's the pastor of the Hills Church. He's been there now for 10 years. Three, th- no, more than that on his own. Uh, we left in 2016. Um, he's pastoring there. So he's taken on the senior pastor role. He's doing an absolutely great job. But that was a forgotten promise. Some of you sitting here today, you've, you've a forgotten promise. And I'm challenging you today. Do you trust him? Did he know what he was saying? He lifted up that well lid or wherever you were hiding. And he said, hey, mighty warrior. And you're going, oh, I'm a nobody. I can't talk properly. I can't do the right thing. I'm challenging you today. Today's the day to revisit that and to say, God, I trust you. And take the step towards his truth, not yours, his truth. He saw a, a man hiding in a well. He was frightened. He said, you're a mighty warrior. He certainly wasn't a mighty warrior. He was hiding in the well. But what God saw was his truth. So you might be the same. God's talking to you, his truth. All right. And finally, um, what, about that, what about that worship test? You know, does, does that worship, do, do you get the worship coming to you or deflect it to God? Is it, is it this idea that, um, you know, we're somebody? Or is it this idea that God is somebody? Um, I'm going to read a, um, a poem to you. It comes from this um, passage. And so in this passage, uh, it talks about this passage, but this poem says this. It's called, uh, it's, by, it's by Herman uh, Stumpfli. I'm going to say that because I don't know how to pronounce that. Someone's got to correct me. <clears throat> Jesus, tempted in the desert, lonely, hungry, filled with dread. Use your power, the tempter tells him. Turn these barren rocks to bread. Not alone by bread, he answers, can the human heart be filled? Only by the words that call us is our deepest hunger stilled. Jesus tempted at the temple, high above its ancient wall. Throw yourself from lofty turret, angels wait to break your fall. Jesus shuns such empty marbles, feats that fickle crowds request, God, whose grace protects, preserves us, we must never vainly test. Jesus tempted on the mountain by the lure of vast domain. Fall before me, be my servant, glory, fame, you're sure to gain. Jesus sees the dazzling vision, turns his eyes another way. God alone deserves our homage. God alone will I be obey. When we face temptation's power, lonely, struggling, filled with dread, Christ, who knew the tempter's hour, come and be our living bread. By your grace, protect, preserve us, lest we fall, your trust betray. Yours above all other voices, be the word we hear, obey. Amen. As always, um, we would love for you to check out our website, Um, The link will be down below. Um, And on there, there is a prayer tab. Um, If you would like to click on that and let us know what's going on in your life or any prayer requests, we would love to know. Um, There's also a Blue Connect card. If it's your first time here with us, we would love for you to fill that out so that we can get in contact with you and see what's up. Um, Yeah, we hope you have a great week and we'll see you next Sunday.